The ancient Near East was a land of empires. And empires, however great, must, without exceptions, fall. In 612 BCE, the Assyrian Empire, which had created the most formidable army ever seen in world history, fell to invaders who sacked the capital of Nineveh. A little bit about the Assyrians. They were perhaps the most brutal of all the ancient empires. They prided themselves on their bloodthirsty reprisals on rebellious or conquered peoples. Their palaces were lined with reliefs showing these atrocities. When the invaders brought down the walls of the great Assyrian capital, no one was there to mourn. To fill the massive power vacuum came an old empire, the Babylonians, representatives of the Mesopotamian civilization, first born from the Fertile Crescent 3,000 years before. And a new empire, the Medes, a mysterious people from the steppes of Iran. The Medes were, in fact, the predecessor to a new era. For all prior history, the Near East had been the center of civilization. The Medes were the first step in a massive shift in power. The first step in the death of the Old World. In 559 BCE, a man rose to the throne of a frontier kingdom named Anshan. His name was Korosh, but we will call him Cyrus. When Cyrus came to the throne, the Medes were still overlords of much of what is now modern-day Iran, including his kingdom. He must have done something to upset the Medes, however, because in the mid-550s, the Median king Astyages sent a general named Harpagus to Anshan with an army. His orders were to subdue Cyrus, perhaps because he was asserting his rights as an independent ruler. Pause for a point. Cyrus's mother was a Median princess, the daughter of Astyages. This was a common political practice for empires like the Medes seeking to maintain power. Marrying daughters to other kings of subsidiary kingdoms was a great way to build dynastic connections and alliance networks. Back to the story. Through some political maneuvering and negotiations, Cyrus managed to convince Harpagus to revolt against the Medes and join him in a war against Median authority. Herodotus tells us a fantastic story that Astyages killed Harpagus' son and made a meal out of him, feeding Harpagus his own son before telling him what he was eating. Probably didn't happen, but it's wonderfully dramatic and kind of terrifying. The timing of this war was good, as the Medes were dealing with other unrest. The war slowly turned in Cyrus's favor. In the year 550 BCE, the Median capital of Ecbatana was captured. Cyrus, in his benevolence, spared the life of his grandfather, Astyages. In the process, his state absorbed the territory of the Medes. At this point, he also incorporated many of the subject kingdoms of Anshan to form the Persian Empire. When Cyrus conquered the territories of the Medes, he inherited a pretty decentralized political organization. The Medes had allowed local rulers to hold power as long as they kept allegiance to Median authority and supplied soldiers for war. This was a very different sort of state organization from what was happening in Mesopotamia. The Assyrians, for example, had been pretty centralized and aggressive about asserting their cultural supremacy. 
the Babylonians followed this example. In keeping with this, the Assyrians and Babylonians were generally merciless to peoples they conquered and subjugated. The elites and nobles would be executed, and the poor would be sold into slavery. This was a feature, not a defect, of Near Eastern politics and war, and it had been for centuries. Cyrus, in showing leniency to the Medes, and adopting a relatively tolerant model of state organization, changed the whole paradigm of geopolitics in the ancient world. Cyrus's next campaigns came in what is now modern-day Turkey, when he marched against the Kingdom of Lydia sometime in the 540s BCE. This kingdom was the first state to make widespread use of metal coinage, particularly precious metals like gold and silver. For this, the king of Lydia, a man named Croesus, was famed for his wealth across the Near East. According to Herodotus, Croesus received a prophecy upon asking whether he should fight with Cyrus. The prophecy told him that if he attacked Cyrus, he would destroy a great empire. So he attacked. Cyrus was a swift and decisive general. He drove his army straight into the heart of Lydian territory, besieging Croesus in his capital. After a battle, the Lydian army was defeated and Croesus was captured. Thus, Cyrus added another rich possession to his rapidly growing empire. Croesus was spared, becoming a close advisor to Cyrus, along with other former kings and nobles. Cyrus's willingness to work with his old enemies rather than destroy them was pretty much unprecedented. But Cyrus also had unprecedented ambitions for his empire, and he decided that, for his purposes, it was better to be loved than to be feared. In 540 BCE, Cyrus finally marched against the Babylonians. These were an ancient people with thousands of years of history, a formidable military, and dominion over many kingdoms of the Near East. These were the armies that had brought down the mighty Assyrian Empire. These were the heavyweight champions of the old world. But one battle was all it took to bring it all down. After a crushing victory in the field, Cyrus and the Persians entered Babylon in late 539 BCE. Babylonia and all of its dominions were thus integrated into the Persian Empire. What was so special about Cyrus? Well, as mentioned before, when Cyrus built his empire, he operated in a radically different way from all the empires that preceded him. The Assyrians and Babylonians used brutality and horrible atrocities to keep subject peoples subjugated. Cyrus presented Persian authority as a lenient alternative to other empires. Of course the Persians could still be brutal and oppressive, but relatively speaking, they were basically the nicest imperial overlords ever. Cyrus almost always spared the lives of civilians and nobles, allowed local government and cultures to continue, and generally kept a good relationship with the peoples he subjugated. This is why he faced almost no opposition from the people of the Medes and Babylonians after his successful conquests. Perhaps the people saw him as the better option. Cyrus proved this by making up for the mistakes of previous empires. Notoriously, the Babylonians had destroyed much of Jerusalem and forced the Jews into captivity across the Near East. Cyrus brought them all back to their homeland and personally sponsored the reconstruction of Solomon's temple, known to history as the Second Temple. Cyrus has been universally praised 
by all sources. He is a legendary figure in the Hebrew Bible, the only non-Jew to be named a Messiah. The Greeks, including Herodotus and Xenophon, sing his praises. One of his proclamations, discovered as the Cyrus Cylinder, is thought to be the first proclamation of human rights in human history. Cyrus met his end in 530 BCE, during a war with a dangerous tribe known as the Masagatai. Reportedly, he died in the fighting against the army of their warrior queen, a fearsome woman named Tamiris. Apparently his body was recovered because it once sat in a tomb in the capital of his Persian empire. An empire that he had come to as the king of Anshan and left as the king of the universe. There are different accounts of the inscription that was once on the tomb, but my favorite goes like this. Here I lie, Cyrus, King of Kings. <laughs>